until um, for about 20 minutes. Yeah. Perfect. When you're ready, Rachel. Okay, thank you. So good morning, everybody. Um, I don't actually see who's attending, but as Kate has, has told you, um, pop any questions that you've got into the um, text box. Um, I don't think, I can't hear anybody, you can hear me. Um, so any questions that pop up as you go along, please just type them out. My name's Rachel, Rachel Arnold. I'm one of the dental tutors. Um, I have been for a long time. I've um, gone through a lot of generations of students, but I was also a student myself at Birmingham University, so I know the course very well. Um, what I will talk to you about today is one of our known as caries. So when we say caries, that's dental decay. And certainly when I was a student and a young practitioner, that was pretty much all we did all day. It was to take decay out and fill teeth. Um, things have evolved. You get a lot of different um, dental disease now and dental problems. And whole days may go by now um, when you're all practitioners, when you don't do a filling um, and when you do, there are so many more uh, techniques at your disposal um, to fix teeth nicely. So certainly in the time when I've, uh, that I've been working, um, dentistry has changed for the better in so many ways. Um, the classification um, by Blacks is just simply to tell you where the decay is. Um, it doesn't tell you why the patient got decay. But knowing where it is, what shape it is, and how you'll access it, access it is very useful. More importantly um, is diagnosing it to start with. Get it right. Is it a, um, a lesion that needs to be repaired? Is it some very early decay that you can help to remineralize so that you don't need to give the patient a filling? Um, what is the patient's uh, level of decay? Is it very, very minor? Is it a big cavity? And um, into that will come risk, assessing your patient's risk. And um, I'll talk to you about managing um, small fillings because that's what you will start with on clinic. Um, as first and second year students, you're uh, not just classroom based, you work in the skills lab. So obviously you learn how to handle all our instruments, our rotating instruments, the drills, as well as all the hand instruments. You learn how to use the materials that we use for repairing teeth and um, you will uh, get patient contact in that you'll be invited on the student clinics. You'll work with senior students, say fourth and fifth years, who will buddy up with you and explain to you what they're doing and you'll get very close in, you'll assist, perhaps do the suction. So you get introduction to patients. A practitioner, you've got your own group of patients, you run a little practice. Some of those patients will stay with you for, for three years and um, you'll, you'll make friends with them. Um, black classifications didn't seem so old when I was a student because at least it was in the same century, 1900 now. You think, how can that possibly be relevant? But we use it as a shorthand and it is very useful if you say to anybody of any generation, I've got a class two cavity to do, they'll know what you mean. Um, the reason that Black's classification didn't include root decay, secondary caries, um, was that teeth weren't kept long enough to develop root decay. Any tooth that had a root exposed um, that could get decayed was um, compromised due to, to gum disease. Um, gum disease wasn't recognized or treated. Um, once the root was exposed and the tooth was a bit wobbly and the gums were bleeding, that tooth was taken out. So root caries didn't generally happen and get treated as a separate entity because your, your ancestors, your great grandparents would have lost their teeth fairly early on. Um, secondary caries is when um, a tooth has been filled but the fill's, filling's starting to break down and um, non-carious tooth surface loss we will come on to but that's when teeth need fixing but not because of tooth decay. But basically tooth decay is always, always has been, always will be caused by sugar um, and a big, big part of your work now will be prevention. 
we use diet sheets, um, we ask patients simply, uh, as any other health practitioner would, doctors, you know, nutritionists, uh, your, your PT instructors, um, what do you eat, when do you eat it? And um, we try and identify anything in our patients' diets that might be causing them to have tooth decay and try and get them gently um, involved in their own care. So patients taking responsibility for themselves will do much better um, than you lecturing them. They have to understand why they've got to eat less sugar and brush their teeth better. And it gets you involved in the patient's lifestyle. Once you've been in a practice for a while and, and your patients know you very well, you'll start talking to them all sorts of, of um, lifestyle advice. Um, we've got plus one here. These are your pits and fissures so, um, and cusps. So the cusps are the biting bits of your teeth. You can feel them on your own teeth. They're sharp. They cut through the food. They mash the food. And on your back teeth, you've got two or four cusps. And in between those cusps, we've got fissures. Pits are the little round ones like this. Fissures are the lines. And it's very easy if a patient has sugar, it settles into these pits and fissures. And um, it is not so easy to brush off. And um, if patients aren't very good at brushing, you'll very soon get decay in these pits and fissures. Birmingham is fluoridated. We um, get enough patients for you to see who've got early decay. Um, but patients um, in elsewhere in the country um, will have much, much higher incidence of, of pit and fissure caries. Fluoride very nicely strengthens your enamel and protects you from these early lesions. Um, I think this has probably had a lining in it. So this first slide shows the point at which we stop. This might look bad, but actually if it feels hard, it's decay, um, damage, but the, the dentine, which is the layer underneath the enamel is holding its own. So this is, is a pretty much a completed cavity and that's got a little lining in which helps the pulp, which is the area below the dentine, not to get damaged. The class two cavities are a lot harder to find. Um, if you look at this area with a trained eye, it's not just the photographer's light, it is more gray. So this is white, this is gray. And when a burr was sunk into that, yeah, it was decayed. So you might see it, um, but you probably won't feel it until it becomes quite a big cavity. So that's when we rely on taking x-rays, which I will come back to. Um, this area is a lot harder to access carefully because you can imagine um, when you were preparing this, as it happens, this is, is decayed anyway, but you can imagine getting a burr into there, you would very easily damage that tooth. And what we teach you as soon as you get onto the clinical skills lab is manual dexterity. We teach you how to be clever with your drill um, and not do any damage as you go. This um, is, is actually, that's not actually a typical class three cavity. Um, I will show you one in a minute, um, but you can see how in teeth further forward in the mouth, we can actually access decay um, in the, oh, I didn't tell you what a proximal surf uh, surface meant. That's the contact point, okay? So in molars, you've got a big wide contact point and the only way of getting into it is from above. Teeth further forward, it's a bit more two dimensional and you can get to that cavity without destroying this bit here. This is called a matrix and it's not used to separate the teeth um, when you're drilling, you still do have to be careful, but it's used to separate the teeth when you're filling them so they don't stick together. And um, class four is, so this is a, a class three cavity. Um, no, that's a staining actually, but this is a class three filling and um, you see it's a bit of a saucer shape. It's just not perfectly colour matched. Um, quite a lot of class three cavities are actually pretty much invisible. Um, a class four cavity involves the angle of the tooth. This may well be decayed. This tooth's uh, got a crown on, this tooth's got a filling in, so that patient has got some level of decay. This patient here um, might have had an accident. It's a very symmetrical um, shape. They haven't got any decay that you can see on any other teeth. Um, one of the departments on which I work at the dental hospital sees um, accidents and emergencies 
Monday mornings, we see these quite often. Patients have been playing sport, um, they've come off their bikes, they've been involved in, in punch-ups, and this is the sort of thing that um, is due to trauma, not decay. But it's a good example of... Um, okay. This is more of a typical class five than this one. I would argue actually that this shows us what root decay looks like. Um, because that patient has got a lot of gum recession. Originally, their gum level would have been about here. So this filling here is a class five. This one here is, is more uh, root decay. It might even be extreme wear. Sometimes patients really go at their teeth um, with an extra hard brush and they can do this damage themselves. Um, this again is a crown and you can tell because there's a, a huge color difference between the root and um, I would say that's probably quite an old crown. Our new ones are much more aesthetic than that. But here is a class five cavity. Easy to diagnose, easy to treat. Um, if you got that as your first um, cavity to fill on clinic, I'd be happy for you because it's, it's easy to do. Um, you're not going to damage any of the surrounding tissues. You're not going to get in a mess with the material. You're not gonna to have to do much drilling. Um, However, that could so easily have been prevented and we'll come on to prevention in a moment. Um, a slight modification of the old blacks classification um, is where has the disease happened, but also how has it happened? Has it happened because the sugars settled into these pits and fissures or um, is it because the patients aren't cleaning very well on their smooth surfaces? or is it areas that um, are inaccessible, such as the roots? And then you've got your, your secondary caries, so where um, fillings are starting to fail. And um, the diagnosis, I was gonna say, is the most important thing. Actually, prevention is the most important thing, but once the, the decay has happened, um, its diagnosis is the most important thing because not only will it help you not to miss things, but it will help you to decide what sort of decay you're dealing with. You need to fill it. We don't start with our um, instruments. We don't start with our probes. We start with our eyes and our fingers. So before you pick up anything and start touching the patient, just have a look at them because um, a healthy patient may see you every six months, every 12 months. Uh, maybe every two if they're a very dentally very healthy patient. Have they seen their GP in that time? Maybe not. Um, it may be that you're the only health professional they see year in, year out. So you are um, duty bound to generally check their health, which you do with a, a questionnaire. But as you're talking to them, look at them. Do they look pale? You know, do they, do they look like they might be anemic? Have they got odd skin lesions, freckles that you didn't notice before, ulcers that you didn't notice before? We pick up, um, or certainly, uh, yeah, pick up's a good word for it. Not diagnose so much, but certainly see the first signs of, of lots of different diseases, certainly skin conditions. And, um, and even if a patient's got a bare arm or you can see um, you know, the, the bottom of their neck or their scalp, and you see something, just because it's not inside the mouth doesn't mean it's not your job. Um, so we do, and, it, and it's, it's a good feeling to be a holistic practitioner to involve you with other um, health professionals. Feel like you're doing a good job and a more interesting job. Um, so look at your patient first, look outside the mouth, and then look inside the mouth. Does the soft tissue, which is the skin of the, um, the lips, the cheeks, um, inside the mouth, the tongue, the palate, does it all look healthy? And that's way before you start looking at their teeth. And you feel them as well. So is, is there a bump? Is there a bump that wasn't there before? Is it hard? Is it soft? Um, and then finally pick up your probe and just start tapping gently on the teeth. And I mean gently, and I will go to the next slide um, before I come back to radiographic and transillumination. Um, because teeth need to be clean. Some patients, when you come in um, to do an examination, you'll say to them, this is a basic exam, but if you don't mind, I'll do it again after I've cleaned your teeth, because actually I can't see. So if that's plaque, you really need to remove it before you know that these two surfaces are 
um, healthy. And they are. The gum's not looking healthy at the moment, but it will start to improve now you've removed the plaque. But the um, tooth surface itself is healthy. This up here is a good example of wear or erosion, your non-carious um, tooth surface loss, and they've ground that down or maybe they've, they've worn it down. Um, and enamel is shiny. Um, wet enamel is really shiny. It's almost like a mirrored surface. Um, so you can't honestly say that you know that that tooth is healthy. Look at the bubbles here and you need to get rid of those bubbles before you know that 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 fissure is healthy so you have it you dispose a little tool called a triple syringe you might remember your dentist blowing on your teeth it blows out air or it blows out water or it blows out a mixture and you would just gently dry that tooth with some blown air or some cotton wool if the patient's tooth was sensitive to air and this is what you find underneath that you would not stick a probe into um, because i would like to think you could get that tooth to be um, cured almost if you like we we try and arrest decay we try and get um teeth to remineralize um have a look at this probe that looks quite evil um magnified um so what we would want you to do is use that just to perhaps remove a little bit of debris that was on the surface and once you're a trained clinician you'll know the difference between nice hard enamel and something that that is perhaps starting to um, demineralize but what we would definitely discourage you from doing is poking it in because here um, again you need a bit of a trained eye but if I can point out this white triangle that's some very early decay now a low or medium risk patient definitely wouldn't need that filling you would apply fluoride you'd apply it regularly you would alter their diet you'd alter their brushing technique and that will probably never need a filling do this with a probe and you need a filling straight away. And that's what we call an iatrogenic um, disease because the patient didn't have a cavity until you did that. And now they've got a filling that they've got to pay for. Um, so really use your probe just with caution. It's almost just a counting tool really. We have other probes that have got a nice little ball on the end and you can't do any damage with those. Those are used for um, looking at patient's gums and um, we teach you the pressure, we teach you very accurately the pressure with which it's safe to use those. Um, we were on a slide up here about, there we go, radiographic. Um, as clinicians, we do take x-rays um, a lot more frequently than um, anybody other than perhaps orthopedic people. Um, and the next slide that I'll come to, which will probably be the last, um, will show us the risk um, that we assess to see whether the patients need us to take x-rays frequently or not. Um, Transillumination, shine the light through to, if it's decayed, it looks different. Um, and the difference between symptoms and signs um, tell you it hurts, it feels wrong, um, and signs are what we find. These are fancy things that you'll get later in your career. You won't get these perhaps on your first day of clinic, but they help us to diagnose decay. Um, so in the last sort of minute, um, patients can be high, medium, or low risk. Um, and we, uh, there we go, high, medium, or low. This patient hardly ever needs anything doing. This patient needs seeing every six months and really frequent x-rays. And it may be because their diet's bad or they're medically at risk from tooth decay or you've never got them clean very well and take x-rays on these ones frequently. Low risk patients, you'll have a chat with, you'll pass the time of day and then you'll say, see you again in two years. Um, <clears throat> this slide, too complicated to look at um, on, a, on a day like this, but um, we score the patients um, risk and um, propensity to tooth decay. Um, we look at what they've got in the mouth and we decide on how and when to treat the decay according to it. Um, and we have talked about prevention. So patients have to take responsibility for their own um, dental health, but we can help them along a little bit by sealing teeth, which you may have had done yourselves or popping fluoride on. And the Department of Health is one of the people who give us guidelines um, and they'll tell us how often to 
um, do what, but you'll get guidelines from um, all sorts of bodies and they will change as you go along. Um, but initially, your first contact with your patients on clinic will be, um, what's your diet like? How do you clean? Okay, let me show you how to clean. Let me, let me look in your mouth. Have you got any cavities? All right, well, I'll clean your teeth first and then we'll go on to changing um, the, the environment in which those cavities have occurred as well as um, fixing them. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I don't